Okay, so fine. Today I'm going to talk about a topic uh, which has become somewhat uh, close to my heart, uh, which I believe I've not spoken about publicly yet. I've written a little bit here and there, and that is that they change the names every once in a while. Um, the topic of climate change, which many, many people speak about uh, in different forms, I'll do something that most of the people in the world don't do, and that is to try to give the, the matter some halachic perspective, okay? Uh, people talk about it. Greta Thornburg has spoken around the world about all sorts of parts of it. I don't think she's spoken about halacha yet. Those who know the Nobel uh, his Peace Prize laureate, a couple of years ago, uh, who was a, was a teenage girl, she's probably no longer a teenager, uh, who champions the topic of climate change. And there was the fact that, or the claim that um, human behavior uh, has caused all sorts of changed changes in the climate, uh, most famously heating up, but storms and droughts, et cetera, et cetera. And that what's even more severe is that it's expected in the next couple of decades to become much, much worse, uh, deadly and causing upheavals in society and tremendous, tremendous pain and ultimately death to many people. That is the claim. Uh, I will point, uh, so that's, I want to talk about this topic from a halachic perspective, but a little bit of a disclaimer in the beginning. This is a topic that I have started thinking about about maybe about a year ago more seriously. Um, I am not an expert on the topic from the, uh, uh, certainly not from the practical perspective. I've read a decent amount. I don't consider myself an expert about the problem or the, or the solutions. Uh, I am a rabbi who's read on the topic. Um, am I supposed to be doing the, the admitting? Yes, I can. Okay, um, but I will tell you what the traditional approach of Rabbanim, at least in the base medrash, Batei medrash that I have learned in, uh, Yeshiva University, Eretz Chemda, um, that our basic approach is that unless we know otherwise, if we have experts on a field, uh, probably most famously in the field of medicine, uh, we follow the experts. That's the general rule that halachics uh, uh, take. One of the sources that we have on the source sheet, which I'll put up when appropriate, uh, one um, that's found in many areas, halach and Shabbos, as far as pikuach nefesh, in different areas. That is the general rule. A rabbi, we believe, should be uh, well enough versed on a topic to understand what the experts are talking about. Um, to see, is it really true that the experts more or less agree on a certain point or not, uh, to know what to ask, to know how to apply, that much the rabbi should do, but he cannot be expected to be an expert doctor, an expert uh, climate scientist, et cetera, et cetera. So for the purpose of this year and probably any other presentation of mine, I, I have done what I believe is my due diligence in um, ascertaining that the strong, strong, very strong, more than in most topics that exist, uh, consensus of uh, climate scientists is that the fears are well-based. Exactly how it will turn out, we don't know. If we don't do anything, we don't know exactly. They're just predictions. They're um, based on scientific evidence, but it's not exact, it's not exact. So it's a forecast, uh, not a report of what already happened, uh, but a forecast. Um, but in any case, the forecast is considered to be extremely credible and that there is a real danger to society. Okay, we talk about society, this is gonna be important in our discussion, talk about society, we're talking about global society. There clearly there are certain countries and cities and regions that are expected to get it worse than others. Um, and you know, if somebody lives on the coast, then the rising of, of the of the sea of the oceans is more something that uh, affects them. If somebody is in an arid country, 
and that arid country could turn into an absolute desert uh, that more affects them. So he lives in a, a very hot country, but is bearable. And if it could become unbearable, that affects them. Um, uh, and therefore, this is a rare situation that uh, we have a global problem. Anybody, anywhere in the world can help acerbate the problem by being wasteful, by uh, contributing to the, to the pollu pollutants, the carbon emission, et cetera, can cause the problem. Those who will get it may be very, very places. So I'm going to um, be assuming for now that the person who has to make a decision uh, is in a place that he is not in particular known danger. He lives, I don't know, he lives in central Canada, not on the border with the United States, where it's plenty cold. It would be kind of nice, a little bit warmer. It's not near any ocean, so not going to be flooding from that. Uh, they're, they have, they're, not, they're not expecting drought. It's just the fact that it's something that affects the world is that, you know, he's willing to take the risk for, his, for himself, for his family. If his children and grandchildren decide to live in the same place he does, he doesn't see any specific problem for them. Uh, let's assume even if that, that is correct, the fact that it affects others, to what extent is that a halakhic concern, okay? Um, by the way, if you have questions that you can ask, if somebody has very strong opinions and they want to use this as a, as a, a um, as a place to, you know, speak about them at length, and I would I would ask not to do that. But if somebody has, certainly has a question, a comment, um, and as I'm developing this uh, this talk and uh, trying to find more sources and more uh, insights, I'd be happy to hear insights from people. Okay, so um, I once wrote about this. I don't have the type of memory that if I read it, I would remember everything, but probably the first part of the presentation is very much overlapping with something that I wrote for a very nice publication called Why You Told Where To Go. I think it's called Why You Told Where To Go. They have before the Chagim. Uh, so before Rosh Hashanah, um, I wrote about the, the first part of the topic, where I'd say the more Ashkafic part of the topic, uh, in general terms. And I had two applications in mind, and I, I hinted at them, didn't talk about them at length. One, two, I don't know who calls this, I guess it's a chova, but in certain ways it, it's, it gives a new opportunity that people didn't have before. Uh, the corona uh, pandemic, with the stress on the word pan, the part of the word pan, means it's broad throughout the world. And this question of climate change is are unique things. I don't think that 200 years ago, I'm trying to think, was there anything that happened 200 years ago that people knew at that time said, well, we have a, we have a global problem. So if people in Aristotle do this, it's gonna affect people in Brazil. Or if people in Brazil do something, it's gonna affect people in Aristotle. I, I can't think of something like this. So this is, you know, they talk about because of, of uh, communications, they talk about the world becoming uh, a global community, you know, a global village. So these two events uh, that are uh, unfolding in different, uh, different ways are an unusual, in, in terms of history, an unusual phenomenon. Maybe part of it's just because our scientific knowledge is greater, that we now have more tools to know how things, uh, how would somebody in the shtetl 200 years ago know that what they were doing would affect somebody uh, hundreds of miles away. Uh, now we know in, in, in a way that we didn't know before. Okay, fine. Um, now there are people who take a very strong um, stand and would tell you the following. There are all sorts of things that we do in our daily lives that are considered to uh, contribute to climate change issues, okay? I, again, I'm not a big expert, and even now I'm not gonna go through the entire list. I mean, just, uh, what is carbon emissions, including using your car, uh, driving your car? Let's take another one, um, eating beef, okay? And one of the most surprising as scientists, maybe you're used to it, that the uh, gas released by, by cows 
has an incredible effect. I mean, not each cow, but cumulatively has an incredible effect on the climate. I never would have guessed that in my life, but that's what mo I think almost all experts say uh, is the case. Uh, and therefore, if we cut back on consumption, so then they won't, the world won't need as many cows. They won't develop as many cows. The ones people want to eat, they'll shut them and then there'll be fewer cows because you won't work on developing so many in the next generation. So some people will say it's forbidden to eat meat because of the impact that it has on society, okay? I am now at this point not saying if I agree or disagree, but that is a claim. Uh, and you know, the person will say, well, in a second, if it doesn't, what is my eating meat? What effect does it do? And the answer is, okay, you're part of it. We need everybody. If everybody will listen to me and everybody, I'll, you know, have a very popular Twitter account and my, what are they called? Followers, I think. If my hundreds of millions of followers uh, on my account will all listen to me and stop eating meat, they'll have a huge effect. And therefore I'm demanding of everybody you should know it's immoral to do it. And if we're halachic people, it's us to do it. Okay, that, that would be the claim. Um, now, in order to come to a halachic uh, decision of that type, we need to go, through, we need to make a, a bunch of uh, assumptions. We need to prove a bunch of assumptions. I wrote down five. Some of them may be broken up into more. Uh, but here are my five. Um, first of all, again, I'm living in uh, central Canada, uh, and I don't expect any, pro any problems from global warming or rising of the oceans. It's only about other people, okay? And maybe, maybe we'll say I'm very uh, into the Jewish community. That's my responsibility to the Jewish community. I don't, you know, Go around doing immoral things about others, but my, you know, the things that I really to go the extra mile, I only do for my brethren. Um, so, um, so that could be a claim. So in order, let's assume that's true. Let's say that Israel is not. I don't think it's true. Israel is not going to be seriously impacted. The New York community, the London community, all the major Jewish communities are not going to be affected. So the question is, do I care about the rest of the world? Okay, that's one assumption that you would have to assume that, yes, I do care about the, the rest of the world. Another way I care about is not being, and I say this in uh, double, triple, quadruple quotation marks, not being too from. What do I mean by that? In other words, a person could say, listen, Hashem runs the world. And many people do say this. Hashem runs the world. And Hashem won't allow the world to suffer a catastrophe if we don't deserve it. And if we do deserve it, then it's not going to help to try to avoid it because Hashem will make sure that we have the catastrophe in any case. Okay? So... We have to, if we say that, no, you should change your behavior to avoid a catastrophe, you have to assume two things, two related things. I count this as one, that Hashem's not going to save us, where Hashem may not save us if uh, we go around their merry way and ignore the problem, and that it will help. I mean, if we have the problem, it won't help, uh, because if Hashem wants us to have a catastrophe, apparently we deserve it, and therefore all of our actions all of the, the king's horses, all the king's men will not save us from the catastrophe, okay? That's another point we have to look at. Those are ashkaf, two ashkafic points. Then the next thing we have to look at is um, I can be prevented from doing something which uh, at face value just has to do with me. What does anybody else care about if I eat meat? or not, so if I have high blood pressure from that, that's my problem. What in the world did I do? I went to the store, I paid money for it. What did I do wrong? Well, no, it causes us damage. Cause you damage the, I eat meat causes you damage. Well, because of this, because of you, they raise more, more cows, because they raise more cows and the cows do this, they, they do that. That, um, or that I drive my car, maybe more than I need to. No, you can't drive. 
my draw. I can't drive my car. I drive under the speed limit. I'm very careful. What in the world? I had my car checked. It doesn't have more emissions than it's supposed to have. What am I doing wrong? Uh, that no, the, the people can say you are doing something that bothers us. Uh, another thing which one can count the same or not is I can be doing something. Maybe I, re I really did four before three. Three should have been if I'm doing something which is damaging, uh, but not directly. It doesn't directly impact people. It's more indirect. And the second thing, I'm not doing something damaging at all. I'm doing something totally normal, totally expected. I'm eating. I'm going from one place to another. What in the world do you want from me? You want me to, to be in a straitjacket the rest of my life and not do anything because it may offend somebody? So I'm doing a perfectly, that's number four. And the fifth issue is who gets to decide what uh, we should be doing and not doing? Do rabbi, do, does halacha get to decide? Do rabbis get to decide? Who gets to decide at what point? Um, and is it from a halachic perspective, okay? If I said the halacha gets to decide, the rabbis get to decide, I don't think uh, prime minister here or the president of America or the prime minister of uh, England or anywhere else uh, will really listen to me. But from our perspective, who do, who, I'm giving this share, I guess, who do I think has authority to speak on such matters? Okay, those are my five things. Again, that, um, that we care about what has happened to the world, even if it doesn't affect us and our neighbors and our even our country, perhaps. Two, that we believe the hishtadlis is uh, needed and effective, okay, doing taking concrete actions, that somebody can prevent me from doing something damaging, even though it's not, not causing direct damage, sort of a type of we would call it halacha maybe grama. Down the line, it can have an impact, but now there's no direct effect. Uh, and that somebody can, can say, don't do something which is not, we don't usually call damaging, it's a normal act of human beings. And the fifth issue we need to look into is who has authority to speak on the topic. Any questions at this point? Okay, if that's the case, I will continue going one by one. Okay, and for this, I will start doing share screen. Uh, many of you, all of you, I don't know, uh, should have gotten the source sheet. I have don't do nothing. I changed it since it was sent out. Um, and here we go. Okay. So uh, if somebody does talk, I guess it will be less likely to that I will hear you. It should just jump on my screen, but I, I may be a little bit less attentive than usually. I like seeing the people I'm talking to. And now I can't really, I can only see three or four people. Um, so, uh, but in any case, I'll try to go in and out of the screen. So I do get to look people in the face, even if it's in the small, small boxes. Okay. So the first, the answer to the first question, do we care about what's happening to the world? I think the answer is yes. Okay. And I bring a couple of classic sources say that even if we are, you know, care very much about the Jewish people, and it's normal, by the way. It's, you know, sometimes people talk uh, that you, know, you have to treat everybody in the world as equals. Nobody really does that in the Maisa. And it was interesting about, what, about a year and a half ago, when they started to break out the, the vaccine, the, the COVID vaccine. So it was talk, some people saying, you know, we have to give, we have to give out the, um, the vaccines according to need, but equitably, everybody, every country would be a key to figure out the World Health Organization should decide how to do it. And we shouldn't have richer countries hop, come in and hop the thing. Okay, there were some people who talked about that. I was wondering what my opinion on was that. I knew, again, they wouldn't ask me. But uh, at the end of the day, even countries that are considered more liberal, okay, they gave their funds for, for other, for poorer countries. They gave a little bit, they gave a few hundred thousand here, a few hundred thousand there. But for the most part, the countries took care of themselves first. Okay, in our situation, uh, our nation, I live in the state of Israel, which is a Jewish and democratic state. Uh, but even those who don't, we have a special uh, bond, a bris. I guess started uh, Shavuos uh, way back when, 3,500, I don't remember exactly how many years ago. 
um, 3,700 years ago, uh, we formed the bris together. And if we have a special bond, special obligations, what about beyond it? Do we care? So the Rambam, I think this is a famous Rambam. I'm going to move my cursor. Uh, if you, I don't know if most people do this. It'll become gray on the screen as I, as I read. Everybody, sometimes I'll be reading, sometimes I'll be just translating. Everybody in the world has that's merits, is demerits, is of sins. And things that work out, Hashem weighs them, who has more merits, who has more demerits. Obviously, that's just the number. Some are more weighted. The fact that a person said Kriyashma is very, very important. Uh, you don't say, well, yeah, I killed somebody today, and I said Kriyashma, so I'm about equal, you know? About one and one. Now, obviously, it's weighted with exactly how the counting goes. We have some very broad ideas. We don't really know any accurate type of way. And there's also, we don't really just look at a person. Um, if, he's, if he's got more demerits, then he's a Russia. If he's equal, he's a Benuni. The same thing is true of a Medina. You can have a Medina that, like him, Stone was judged, and they looked at the people of Stone, and they were judged as a city. So it could be an evil city, an evil Medina. And I know it says like this, somebody who has Adam Shavutam Mubina Shuita, Miyadu Meitirisha. Okay, if when Rosh Hashanah we see Hashem opens the books and the person who's, uh, whose accounting came out in a negative way, he can, uh, there may be things that stay the, uh, the thing, but he is liable to be killed for it. Same thing about Medina, a nation, a state, they have more uh, they wrote, and they can be killed like stone. Okay, stone was not just a little bit over, they were majorly over, but this can happen. The same thing can be with the world and the Rambam. Actually, I think I should have brought in the next piece. The Rambam says that a person, um, a person should look at it uh, as a responsibility to tip not only himself to do a good deed, to not only tip himself, but to tip his Medina and to tip the whole world, okay, to his side. This Rambam comes from in Kiddushin, the end of the first parak. Um, Asa mitzvah, if he did a mitzvah, ach, achat, it could be one mitzvah. Ashrav shechuyet atzmo, that he tipped himself for good things. That kolam katzlut, that he by doing it, he could have tipped himself and tipped the whole world. If he didn't have he could have tipped the whole world for bad. Okay, so we see from this Gemara, this Rambam, that I need to care not only if I do a mitzvah, what's going to be with my personal gzardin, but how what I do impacts um, how what I do impacts my country, and how what I do impacts the world. Okay, so this is here, it's a mitzvot and averot, but the idea that I care, what is it relevant to me? I just care about, and I think a lot of people think about, well, what's gonna be with my olam haba? What's gonna be with my olam hazet? Okay, my family. How many people think, well, if I do a mitzvah, how, what's it gonna do for Kalei Yisrael? And how many people think if I do a mitzvah, how that's gonna help a global problem? We see from this Rambam, from this Gemara, that I care. I'm, I don't know if I do care, I, I hope I do care. We are supposed to care and think in terms, how do what I do, how does it affect the world? So if we can say that, yes, I can do something to, to fix, to help the world, then that's also important, even if it doesn't affect me, even if it doesn't affect my fellow Jew, I am concerned about the whole world. I would add um, that perhaps the extent to which this is true, uh, might depend on the era, okay? Uh, I don't want to say this um, with any certainty, but there is one of my favorite pieces, actually two days ago, bumped into somebody and said, you have to see this piece. Rough Cook, he probably says this thesis many times. To me, the most memorable place is in the first piece of Einaya, the first volume, the first piece, he talks about um, Kriyashma at night and Kriyashma in the day. And he says, Kriyashma at night is talking about the time of galut, of darkness, when things are not going well for us. And Kriyashma in the day, when we're more closer to being high and mighty, 
um, not physically necessarily, but spiritually, but also also physical prominence when Bnei Yisrael were going towards Geula, then it's called Kriyashma Shashachrit. And he says over there that we're like Kohanim. There are times that Kohanim are insular, and there are times that Kohanim go out to the public. Okay, they go to the Beit Mikdash and they work for all of us. They're being very public, caring about everybody. And there are times that Kohanim are insular. When are Kohanim insular? When they are eating truma. Okay, nobody else can eat. Can't invite anybody over. Uh, or you have to send them a different part of the table. If a, if a czar, even with permission from a Kohen, eats the truma. It's a horrible Aveira. So when they eat, they need to eat insularly by themselves. And Rav Cook says that at the time of Galut, of Krishma, of Arvit, when do you, when do, you do it? At the time, when the Kohenim go to eat truma, why pick that? Rav Cook says the idea is that in the time of Galut, we're more insular. And we have to be concerned about ourselves. And in Galut, we're having trouble from our non-Jewish neighbors. And they're persecuting us in many cases. Um, and we have to worry about ourselves to survive the Galut. We don't think about the world uh, nearly as much. When there are time of Gula, so then we're thinking more about our job as Kohanim, Kohanim going out. Now, Kohen is a member of Klai, so correct? But in Parshish Yisra, I'm through with the giving of the Torah, how are B'nai Yisrael described? Mamlechet Kohanim. That we have a job to be religious teachers and functionaries for the whole world. Take a look at what Shlomo's speech when he started the Beit HaMikdash. The dream is not just for us. Eventually, the Beit HaMikdash is going to be the drawing po uh, point for the whole world. So we'll be a Mamlech at Kohanim. We're concerned with everybody. Um, so if we believe in Rishit Smichat Gulatenu that we're well on the path uh, towards Gula, okay? If we've taken steps to Gula, then according to Rav Kook, we should also be step taking steps in the direction of being more of a Mamlech at Kohanim, of worrying about the, the world. Okay, we're leaving the Galut in stages, but very beautiful stages. And therefore, that puts us on a world stage that we're mamlechet konim, have to worry about somebody else. So I would say that perhaps uh, even more so, being concerned about the whole world is more of a, of a uh, calling uh, uh, call to us that now um, than it would have been 200 years ago. Okay, the next hashkafa question uh, is about ishtadlut. Does it really make a difference? Or I should say, listen, Hashem decides everything and that's it. Okay, so the answer over here is this is actually tricky from a Hashkafic perspective. Uh, the mice, we do, we have a medical problem. We treat um, some people not as much as they should, but we, as, as a rule, we take uh, steps to try to fix things. We don't say, well, if Hashem wants me to, to survive, we'll survive with the doctor, without the doctor. If Shem doesn't want me, the doctor's not going to help. We say, no, you take steps. Uh, as far as the positive, rapo, yirape, that is expected to go to a doctor. I think the Ramban says that if somebody's a really big tzaddik, he doesn't need doctors. But most of us, I don't know if we agree with the Ramban. And if we are, I don't know how, I don't know how many people I know who are on that level. Um, I, I've never heard a Rav telling somebody, oh, you're very hush of it. Person, you don't need doctors, you just stop in Tashem. Again, somebody's on that level, they, I'm not saying there is nobody on that level, that's not a normative type of, uh, of approach. And it's not here, and especially we're talking about if you're doing things that cause damage, that is certainly the case. And now we'll see a couple of Makarot together on that. Um, okay, start with number four, the Olam. This is a broad rule. Don't put yourself in a dangerous place. You say, Lomar, show Silones. Then Hashem will save me. Shema eno Silones. Who says Hashem is going to save me? And even if he does, which you can't rely upon, you'll be punished. Not Hashem will say, you know, thank you, you're such a tzaddik. You deserve for me to be you an ace. And the nace brought wonderful. Uh, Kiddush Hashem, because I did a nace for you, because you're a tzaddik, and therefore that's a great Kiddush Hashem, you get schar for the Kiddush Hashem. He says, no, if Hashem, you 
caused Hashem to save your skin from doing this because you did something dangerous, he's going to take off from Zuhya. I gave you a present, but I'm going to write down the ledger. I gave you a big present. I, God, saved your life. So says the Gemara. Based on this Gemara, there is a, in my view, a very important tosis. I don't know they're unimportant tosis, but to me, it's a very, very important tosis. The Gemara says, the Gemara in Ketubot says, Hashem controls everything except for hot and cold. Hmm, global warming. Chutzmit Sinim Pach. Says the Gemara, what does it mean? What does it mean? Hashem, otherwise, Hashem takes care of everything. Doesn't it say you're not supposed to makom sakana? Why shouldn't I be in a makom sakana? If it's not hot and cold, anything else, why can't it be makom sakana? Because Hashem controls everything. So what do we see? Al miyachol the shmor at moment of paranut. We see that Hashem, from there it sounds like I do control my destiny. If, in other words, what does he understand? That if you put yourself, if so, let's not talk you in this case, if Plony puts himself in a dangerous situation, he's likely to die. Cause of death, he put himself in a dangerous situation. You shouldn't stand under a wall, which is uh, leaning. In other words, it can fall. Um, the Asul Adam Lavor Tachtav Hat, okay, and, and not only is it Asur, but it could be that a person will die from it, even though otherwise he didn't. Had he not done, he wouldn't have died. There, you can prevent yourself from silly things, from, from uh, negligent things. A person definitely can kill himself. Somebody who is not deserving of death, if he decides to commit suicide, Hashem, it will not necessarily stop him. Very likely that he will die if he tries. And then he goes on, but other things, things that Hashem initiated, so not. So what do we see? If we, some of the things we don't know, but if we know that something is by the laws of nature, whatever that means, big focus from Rambam and Ramban and others, but by the laws of nature, I'll use the term in any case, if by the law of nature what you're doing is negligent, is dangerous, is harmful, then you're not supposed to be doing it. Not only should you not be doing it, it could cause danger to you. In other words, a person could die or be damaged because of that. Okay, it could be it could be death. It could be financially. Somebody you know, uh, you know, goes to the races every day to bet in the races. Then you know, uh, Hashem's in charge of Parnassah. If you go, you go every day and bet lots of money in the races. You're likely to become poor. So that's uh, another Gemara. Shluche mitzvah in nizokin. The Gemara says, or is a situation talking about bedikas chametz when you shouldn't do bedikas chametz in a way because it's dangerous. Goyim, there might be, might, might be insult, uh, think that you're doing some type of witchcraft, or there might be a, a scorpion over there uh, inside a pile of rocks. If be careful doing it, says the Gemara. Why? But you're doing a mitzvah. People do mitzvahs are not injured, says the Gemara. It's different where the situation where damage is common. I'm trying to uh, translate as, as uh, literally as I can. When damage is, is, is common, it's different. And then he brings an incredible pasuk. Uh, Hashem tells, I can't explain the entire pasuk, but the part that applies to us, I think I explained. Hashem said to Shmuel, go to Beit Lechem, and I'm going to have you anoint the next king. Okay, so that's what Hashem says to Shmuel. Shmuel says, how can I do that? Shaul's going to kill me. Okay, says the Gemara, what do we see from there? Why is he afraid? He's doing a mitzvah. Why is he afraid? The answer is because, yeah, kings do that. When they hear that somebody's anointing the next king, and it's not the first and son, then yeah, kings are known to kill such people. And therefore, even though he's doing a mitzvah, Shmuel is afraid. And Hashem said, okay, I have, an, I have an explanation how you're going to do it to get a lower risk, which is, I mean, the part that I can't really explain here is a direct command from the Kodesh Baruch. But in any case, here we see that Shmuel knows what he's talking about. It could happen that, that the person will die because he's doing something dangerous, even though it was the right thing to do. He was doing a mitzvah. He still should say, no, 
if it's shlicha azeka, I can't do it unless I put into effect the plan to mitigate the problem. Okay, see, there's some sources. Again, the writings of Chazal are very broad. I'm not saying that I have now encapsulated, but my understanding these are representative uh, uh, mainstream uh, opinions of Chazal, Rabbanim, that for normal people, Hishtadlus uh, makes a difference. Not every time. It doesn't mean if somebody gets the best doctor in the world that he's going to, you know, he's going to survive. But um, yeah, it pays to spend, if, you, if a person has the money to spend good money on a good doctor, because it can make the difference. And certain persons should not uh, be more focused on a person shouldn't do something, which is dangerous, apparently dangerous, even though Hashem could save him. A uh, person should not do that. And if he does the dangerous thing, he has nobody to blame but himself if uh, it causes his his damage. Okay, that was point number two. I think, at least in my view, I've uh, hopefully proven. Okay, number three is we're talking about something which is not, you know, Shaul will kill, if Shaul would have killed Shmuel, and Shaul did kill uh, uh, supporters of, of David, if those remember Novi or Kohanim, these things did happen. Um, okay, that was, that's kind of drastic. If you're talking about something that, you know, I uh, use my car, I buy an SUV, and then I drive all over just because I like driving, and a lot of, uh, you know, burn a lot of gas, a lot of carbon is emitted. Still, who, who, am, I direct, who am I hurting in any direct type of way? We have a, a um, category of type of action done, which is important in all sorts of areas of Allah, called grama. Yeah, you can trace something to me, but that's uh, I can't be held responsible for that. People heard of the butterfly effect. Butterfly effect is some type of theory that uh, the, the, the flapping of the wings of a butterfly can cause a hurricane, okay? It sets to, uh, because of this, because of current here, current there, this current, that current, and all because of a butterfly. Statistically, um, the chances are very, very small, but it's possibly true. But even uh, the butterfly cannot be held responsible, not because it's a butterfly, just because he didn't know, because it's too indirect, because so many things went into, that's not called that I did something. So if I do something, if I eat meat, uh, a lot of meat, a lot of beef all the time, and I drive my car a lot and any other, I burn, uh, I have the biggest uh, bonfire in, in, in Lag Baumer, the biggest bonfire in the world, uh, all these things, how much of an effect is it gonna have? And how direct of effect is it going to have? Does that make a difference? Because it's not, it's not direct somewhere. So as far as directness, um, I decided to look about Nizke Shechenim. Nizke Shechenim is a very practical and very hard to apply uh, area of halacha, um, especially when things change from not exactly the same as the situations, how, how houses and uh, properties look in the time of Chazal. But we, in Dine Torah, we do go to Nizke Shechenim, our arguments between neighbors. And the, one of the factors that is involved, uh, some of the, I should mention two factors involved. One is how direct is the damage? And the other, another thing is, did the person, if a person gave me permission, okay? He let me either by saying yes or by allowing me to build, okay? He knew I was building an extra room, I was building out. And now he's, he's, he's complaining to me that I'm too close to his property, but you saw. So you can't say now after I spent all the money building it. So that's something called chazaka by nizke shechem. So there's certain things that may be an exception. So this is ashan. If somebody is causing smoke, okay, then that's different. Okay, that a person can say, you know what? Even though I didn't complain before, well, I'm complaining now. Your smoke is bothering me. Okay, so the Shulchan Aruch distinguishes number, source number seven between Ashen Tadir, it's on a regular basis, and the guy's a baker. And bakers emit, anybody who lives in 
certain part of the Kiat Moshe knows. I always, I don't, I don't think, I guess he doesn't smell it anymore. I don't remember. If it went by the angel's factory. To me, it was always a great smell of the bread through the, the chimneys. People who nearby, you know, they say that the, when they hang up their clothes to dry, they come out with, you know, blackness on them. So, so if you have on a regular basis, you have a baker, that's all the time you're gonna have smoke. That is, oh, that is a problem. But if somebody every once in a while, eh, so close your nose for, for a few minutes, not the end of the world. Okay. The Ramah says, Some say that even if it's not Tadir, if it's not Tadir, rather you can't complain. Even though smoke goes up, but it can go, has it go to the neighbor? The answer is because there's wind. What type of wind? If I live a mile away. So it depends if it, the wind comes on a ruach mitsuya. If it's a normal wind, the type of wind that you have, not that there's a huge, you know, crazy storm. The crazy storm is unusual. I can do what I want in my house affects you only once in a blue moon, um, you can't complain, okay? But um, you can't complain, but if it's something when the Ruach Mitsuya on a normal five miles per hour, 10 mile per hour wind in the direction that happens, so then you can complain, okay? Again, this is just an example of the type of idea that even though I'm doing something in my own house, how does it affect you? It can affect you, and you can protest. And tell, say, you can't tell me what I can do in my house, not do in my house. So therefore, even though, well, it takes a wind to get it to your house. It's not my fault. It's the wind's fault. The answer is, well, since there are winds in this world, it's your fault. Uh, so if we go to the thing of climate uh, change, um, so then a person can say, yeah, it's true that you're, you know, you're uh, driving around all day in your SUV in, in central Canada, but yes, the people in Holland can say we're already, or Venice or Bangladesh, some of the low, uh, low lying countries, um, they can say we're already a few feet underwater, we can't be anymore. What you're doing in central Canada comes to us by Ruach Mitsuya. And it was the way, the way things go naturally, this will impact us in a significant way. Okay, what does Ashan do? Uh, I'm not a, I don't know if they're aware in the time that Ashan could cause death, but it just bothers me. It gets my eyes, it gets, uh, it makes me cough. I don't like, most people don't like it. Uh, then you're allowed to, the, the person can say, this is something that damages me and therefore you need to stop. Um, one further point, one source on this, I promised we talk one, well, at least one source about experts. There's certain rules. How far do you need to eat away? If you have a, a bathhouse, okay, and the, uh, you have a, uh, what we call a bathroom, but by them was a hole in the ground, okay, that can seep into somebody's uh, property and affect things. So how far away do you have to keep it? So there are rules. How far you have to be dalamas for this and eight amas for that? There are rules about how far you need to do. What happens is no gemara, no shulchan aruch about a certain damage. How far you need to keep it away from the boundary of your friend's property? How to keep it away that shouldn't be mazik? The fear of the bikin. You go to uh, people who are experts in the field of whatever the damage is, and they make an appraisal of how far it is. I, it's not a shulchan aruch. I only listen to shulchan aruch. I don't listen to experts. Eh. The answer is no. You're supposed to listen to experts on this. And, and again, this is just one example. Experts say this is causing damage. And you're supposed to listen to the experts. Okay. So I hope that uh, with about 20 to 20 minutes to 25 minutes left, that element number three, that even as the grammar, halacha uh, recognizes damage that I do here. And it impacts somebody thousands. Well, in this case, it's a neighbor. But if we were to know, what difference should it make? If it impacts millions of people in a different different place, uh, if the world is a global community, and think, then then the principle should be the same. It causes them damage. 
they can tell me you must stop. Okay, this is all in principle, exactly how we look. We'll discuss maybe a little bit at the end, but I'm here to discuss principles from a halachic perspective. Number four, this I'm still working on more. Okay, I'm, I, I didn't uh, bring as many, uh, I don't think we're any sources in number four. One second, let me just take a look again. Uh, ah, one second, one second. Okay, here's on the, uh, the tefer. Here's something that's on the tefer, if we look on the, on the, whatever tefer means in English. I'm not the only one who's forgetting their English, right? Um, it's on the border, a better word for it, but it's not coming to me. Um, now, what if the question I'm doing something which is, which is not a problem, it's not considered a mazik by its nature, a normal activity, okay? Um, can I still, be held responsible because I'm doing the normal activity in a um, quantity which makes it problematic. Because so I only, if I did it only a little bit, you're allowed, the halach is not that a person is not allowed to do, produce any smoke in his house. He's allowed to bake. We saw a difference between a yachid and, and a nachtom. A nachtom, a, a baker, probably should be in a place where his, that his chimney is not near anybody's houses. It's like we have weddings in the industrial areas because at night you have weddings, nobody sleeps, nobody lives there. It's only buildings that are busy during the day. So Nachtom should have it out of town. Oil refinery should not be in Haifa. It should be somewhere in the Negev, far away from where too many people are living. Um, but, um, okay, so the quantity, does the fact move something absolutely normal, but the quantity makes it a problem. Um, so, um, one area that comes up, again, I didn't bring sources about this, but the, I think the sources are out there, I just didn't have a chance to, to get to all of them. One of the issues is, as far as health is concerned, okay, let's take the idea of meat. The classical sources have nothing against eating meat, okay? Uh, maybe it's even say it's a positive thing. There are many sources of that being a positive thing. But if a person eats too much meat, that is not healthy. I think Lamar says that Kohanim had intestinal problems because they ate too much meat. Um, so a person that has responsibility, to be careful in that you should be careful about your lives. It could mean spiritually, but as the Chazal also understood it. Physically, don't do things that are dangerous. And um, nutrition is one of those things. So you can take something that in, in moderation is fine, but an exaggerated amount becomes problematic. And so therefore you have a situation, you're not really supposed to, you're not supposed to do things that are even, again, the specific act is fine and everybody does it, but the amount that I did is not responsible. So take something which is mutter, and turn it into usr by a multiplication of the uh, of doing that. Um, now, it's um, we have that by the way religiously as well. Um, Hashem is interested is interested in us. Again, the great great majority. I'm not uh, somebody thinking about being an ascetic, and they want to ask me a question. Should they be ascetic? I don't know. I will not answer. I don't know if too many people want to be ascetics. The normal person is supposed to indulge in the pleasures that Hashem presents to us. You can eat meat, absolutely. Just make sure it's kosher. Uh, other pleasures of the world, which I'd rather not get into too graphically, um, are also considered a wonderful thing if done in moderation. If somebody all day long is only, you know, only bringing himself physical pleasure, that is considered a negative thing. The Ramban talks about it in Parshas Kedoshim. The Ramban, uh, I, I don't remember he coined the phrase, but he certainly used the phrase of naval b'shuta tara. You're doing something that, no, how can you ask her? I'm eating meat. What, where does it say us, towards us to eat meat? It's mutter to eat meat. Yeah, but you're doing it in such a way that is bad, okay? So if somebody does too much, we have a famous case, which may never have happened, but it's a Torah principle of the ben soru more. He's just down the wrong path. 
what am I doing wrong? I'm allowed to eat, I'm allowed to drink. What is the problem? The answer is context. So these are kinds of spiritually or physically, having too much can be a problem. And it might even say us, sir. Okay, but, but uh, the problem is for Rabbi to sing it's Usr is that these are very broad concepts. It's very hard to quantify. In halacha, we like to be exact. Halacha works better when it's exact. Uh, I mean, I think that's a lot very specific that Judaism. It's not just the spirit of the law, be kind person. They're very specific halacha. If you find something that when you have to return, when not, you have to do this, how much you can see how much stucca should you give? A lot of things are quantified very specific. If it's not specific, then a person said, well, it doesn't apply to me. Tell me why I have to do this. Oh, be, you know, I gave it the office, whether literally about stucca or about anything else. I no, so we have very specific laws. When it gets to, sure, do it. Just don't do too much. Well, what's too much? I don't know. Let's say we gave a amount of how much meat a person should have. We have to say, well, no, it has to be per person. We'll have to have what's the size of the person and how much other food does he have? Is it a place that has alternatives we can get protein or it doesn't have alternatives you can for protein? Uh, meat is very important for protein. Protein is critical. Uh, other vitamins, uh, well, I forgot. There's certain things that come from meat. That, okay, if you have alternatives, does a person have alternatives? It's very hard to say, Mutter. Rabbis basically can't do it. They can give a sort of concept, eat responsibly. What's responsibly? And again, we go to nutritionists to tell us that's the type of thing a person should do. Read about, read up on nutrition. That's an important thing. But it doesn't lend itself to being, to being um, asr, asr mutta. Now, if I want, and I want to go back, the point is I probably should have said five minutes ago, but I'm going to say it now. There are two chuvos, important uh, post game of uh, the last generation. Um, uh, one of them is Ritzitz Eliezer, a big expert. Many of you, he was a Dayan, he was a posting for the Shari Tzedek Hospital. He had a lot of on, on medical issues, a lot in all sorts of, and a, little bit, a much better known of Moshe Feinstein, who died uh, Erev Purim 1986. Um, so, talk about the same topic. Uh, about smoking in public places, okay? And this was a very important model for, for a very good, important test case. Uh, I don't remember what the Tzitzel said whether we held was Asr or Mutter to smoke. Rav Moshe held, the question is, did he held it in the end of his life as well? But certainly in writing, he wrote, yeah, it's not the smartest thing in the world, but a person's allowed to do not smart things. Shomer Taim Hashem. Um, I can tell him that um, that a person's allowed to do silly things and Hashem will be watched over him. Where is the line between something dangerous and something silly? That's a good question. This is not a sheer on that. I personally think that nowadays, I think Moshe would agree that smoking is also, I think smoking is also, whatever that's worth. Um, but let's go from the, from the point of view that when Moshe writes this, he holds that a person could say, yeah, maybe be the safest thing in the world. A lot of things not the most the safest thing in the world. You're allowed to do it. What about doing it in public? Okay, are you allowed to do it in public? So if you're in a place that everybody is smoking, nobody minds it, then yeah, you're allowed to do it in public. Or if Moshe says, what about a place? And assuming that it's there, I don't think we see both inside. What if you're in a place where people do care? So here, number 10. Below is Karti Mashkatu, but the Varsha Graham is a Gambi to Torah. Say, listen, if I wanna, I'm learning the base Medrash and I want to smoke. They say, no, no, you want to smoke, go out. Um, or maybe the other way around, to smoke. Smoking can either cause spittle type to go and take it out and like the thing. And, um, so that's going to call this spittle talk, but also the other way around. I am smoking. Do I have to leave the base medrash to do that? 
הדין ברור הוא פשוט כדי כתבתי שאסור למעשנים לעשן בבית מדרש. Those who are smoking uh, are not allowed to do it in the base medrash when כשנמצא שם אף אחד, even if it's only one person, שאין לו משהו, he's not a smoker, שמצטער בזה, it bothers him, he starts coughing, I, um, I was actually allergic uh, to smoking. Um, you know, literally allergic, but Somebody bothers him. Even if he doesn't get sick from it. The kosher can, if it could cause him to be sick, to resolve, to be damaged. Even if they say people, you can't smoke in the Beit Midrash, what are they going to do? Every 20 minutes, they'll go out to take a smoke break. That's going to cause Betul Torah. Rav Moshe Feinstein did not like Betul Torah. Doesn't make a difference. Okay, he wrote this at a time that there was a lot of people wanted to smoke, smoke in the Beit Midrash and probably not so many who cared about it. He said, even if it's one person, anyway, they're not smokers and they say it damages them, they don't have to prove it. Um, they think it caused them damage or it just caused them tsar, they ought to say, you have to stop. So this is important. I, I, I want to bring it for, for two reasons. First of all, um, first of all, it's a matter of, it's indirect. It's not just the person next to you. It can be some the other side of Beit Midrash. I would say furthermore, this is an important point. If it's just me, it doesn't make a difference. L'chor. If there's one person speaking the Beit, in the base Midrash, it affects the person right next to him. It doesn't affect somebody on the other side of the base Midrash. Why is one person in the base Midrash why does he have a problem? Because if there are 80 smokers in the base medrash, then it's going to bother him. Okay? Okay, so tell the other 79 to do it. Or tell, you know, we'll take a Torah note. 10, you know, only 10 people. No, you have to do it. You are responsible for your part. Okay? You can't say, they have a rule in the base medrash, no smoking. You can't say, well, nobody near me. So if it's something bothering it's because not because of just me. It's because of other people. Well, you're part of other people. And therefore, you can't do it as well. It depends on the generation, I think, but we're bringing it now a little bit is because it once upon a time was considered very, very normal behavior. Smoking was absolutely, there's no social stigma to it. You know, the most, uh, now there's more of a social stigma to it, uh, depending where one's li one lives. But then I think there was not a social stigma, it was considered a normal type of thing to do. And it doesn't make, make a difference even though it's a normal thing to do. And millions and millions of people, a very high percentage of society, find this as a basic pleasure in life, as basic as eating meat, um, then it still it impacts somebody else. They have a real claim, then you have to stop. Okay, that's another thing we learned for that. And now on a global basis, everybody smokes. We smoke a car, okay? We turn on the engine, it causes smoke to come out. And yeah, what, my impact is negligible. Yeah, but there are hundreds of millions, millions of people like you who are doing similar things. And the, the um, um, cumulative impact of that, those activities cause damage, okay? Uh, it's at least cause damage in a way that many people, people think it causes damage, okay? Somebody would say, 50 years ago, maybe it's still some people. 50 years ago, people were still saying, questioning whether the people who said that smoking is dangerous, were they really right or they're being alarmists? 50 years ago? Yeah, certainly 60 years ago. Okay, many were saying it's dangerous and there was a size minority and there were famous doctors and also scientists, nah, they're just being alarmists, it's not really a big deal. And maybe if you have somebody has weak lungs, it's not a big deal, okay? Still, that's when Ramosha wrote it. It wasn't clear when Ramosha wrote it how dangerous it was. And yet, they have a real claim that is dangerous, then they have a right to tell you, don't do it. Okay, so I think we've now done numbers three and four about even something indirect, even something that my part is small, it's only because lots of people are doing it. Well, then lots of people have to stop. Okay, that would come to number four. Now we've got to number five, and that is who has authority to speak out and to make rules on this topic. Uh, and this is where I become 
a little bit less resolute than, than some people, okay? I am, believe it's important uh, to, be, to do one's part having to do with climate control, but not, I'm not one of people who thinks to be extreme, you have to be a vegan, you have to sell your car, you have to um, do it. And that is because um, this is something which if it's something which is a global problem and it's not somebody, you know, he coughs because his neighbor has a, a, uh, has a bakery next door and he's, you know, he's coughing, that's a problem. Um, this is something that to find, especially because we're talking about things that everybody needs to do. We can say no plastic can be used. We're gonna have a prohibition. Somebody will come around and inspect your house. They found plastic. This is, we found one plastic spoon, put him in jail. It's not, it's not practical. It's not need the tea. It's not, not in proper proportion. You can't, it's hard to, to say yes and no. No meat, no this, no car, no, it's just not practical. And therefore society has not yet decided to, to be, uh, in most things, to be very uh, one-sided. This thing is forbidden. Um, but is it, is, it for, is it the rabbi's job or not? So I think on a direct basis, it's, it's uh, in theory, if the, the rabbis, whatever that means, if a consensus of rabbis, okay, which itself may be some kind of an ace, but a consensus of rabbi would come and say, we are making a decree that people are not allowed to do this because this is our contribution to global society and to, and to us, because we think it'll impact Israel and Jewish society, but or the whole world, whatever their, their reasoning behind it, the way I presented it in different variation, I guess they could. It's unlikely to happen. Lahore is the job of governments, uh, local governments, so it can be on the state level, it can be on a country level. Uh, I don't know, if, you know, if it's really, if we have a world body that could do it or should be doing it, I don't want to get into that. But certainly there can be on, on a governmental level, there can be rules. Uh, and what do the rabbis think about those rules and does it make a difference? The last source I brought you is one we use in Basin a lot, at least in my Basin, where we're very respective of um, Tina Mahusa in many, many cases, but we don't want it to be like, you know, any law means it's also the halacha. We're not telling anybody to break the law, but does it also become halacha just because of the law? It's the law, but it's not halacha. Okay, so that can be a possibility. It's law and not Allah. So Dina Machus Dina, when does it become Allah? So some Sofer talks about a case of a certain uh, limitations that the Komidat, I don't know the exact translation, but some type of important official. Uh, and he says in our key talks about Dina Machus Dina, when it applies, when it doesn't apply. And this is certainly in this case. What they rule, what the, the law that they came up with is not only is that against the Torah, they did what the Torah, according to the Torah. And they're not going to find the Shulchan Aruch that says what they said, but it's still like the Torah. If people were to come before us, the government come before us and say, Rabbis, we don't want to do anything that you wouldn't uh, agree to. We're, con we're considering a certain law. Okay, what do you think about it? You want us to do it? If we had the power to do it, if we could practically do it, we would do it ourselves. The needs of society are such that we would go along with it because it's a good idea what they're doing. Then it certainly, then it becomes Dina Bukhus Dina. This is some so fair of, yeah, we don't have, the rabbis don't have the authority, but it makes a difference on a religious level, on a religious level, okay, not just on a civic level. On a religious level, if they're doing something, say, you know what? We wish we could have done that. If we did it, nobody listening, but the government can do it. Yasha Koach. That makes a difference. Um, and therefore, as far as authority, as long, again, to say that 
If all the rabbis or all the consensus of rabbis come and say everybody has a halat has an obligation, we are hereby re requiring everybody to become a vegan. Yeah, I would follow that. It's not going to happen any time that I can foresee. Okay, they're not doing that. Um, I don't think that they want to do it. But if they say everybody has to, um, I don't know, not eat meat more than twice a week. Okay, if that's um, that they might do in theory, I have no, you know, could unlikely. But if the government would do that, would there be some type of rationing system? Or what, what system is used nowadays a lot when you want people, you can't say, make something also, but you want to discourage it? What's what system is used? The most common system? Most common system is taxes, tariffs. Okay, you make automobiles expensive. There's a tax on the automobiles and on the gasoline. And you need to raise another few hundred million dollars or shekel. What do you do? Oh, raise the um, the tax on, on cigarettes. Because we anyway people to stop. We're not we don't make a prohibition on it like they did in the 20s, but we want people to use less or maybe not to use it all. Make it pay, and then they'll have to weigh. Is it worth it to me to spend all this ex expense? Okay. I don't want to give presidents there's all sorts of feelings about it. I don't want to get into specifics, but this has been done recently about other things about uh, ecological things, it turned out to be very uh, effective of putting a tax on something and then people start using it less. That's something that governments can do without being, um, well, it's being um, intrusive, but not intrusive like arresting people who, you know, who drank or produced alcohol in the 1920s in the United States, which didn't work very well. So that's something that the rabbis can say, we have a view, we think that's important. A rabbi can say, those who rabbis believe in getting to politics, that uh, call on their followers and the people in their shul, et cetera, that um, support this candidate for whatever position because he is a climate friendly. That's an important thing, okay? And therefore, that's a reason to vote for him. Of course, this becomes very tricky because there's not one issue. That affects uh, affects us. There's so many issues, and what if you have somebody who's on the right side on this, but he's on the wrong side something else? I'm not getting into it. I'm just I'm not turning this political thing. But as a factor to say encourage politicians to be yeah, we the rabbis we're not going to be mitaken, but we think it's a good idea. Halavai that you would be mitaken certain things, certain steps. That would be something would be good. The amount what should be done? I'm not an expert. I'm not going to say anything again. I'm, I've tried to share with you my understanding of the, the principles from a hashkafic uh, and halachic basis with sources, hopefully with a certain amount of logic beyond the sources. Uh, I think uh, that that is the case. Again, I, um, I, important to point out the things that are, are, are that are like the novel Bishut Torah, that, that each act is not is understandable, but the, the cumulative is a problem. Again, I, um, I mentioned that it is not black and white. And in many ways, it's very good that it's not black and white. Not only that it's hard to, to, to make it black and white, it's good that it's not. We have a, stri a strict rule about a certain thing. Let's say <clears throat> that in my personal life, I can do 20 things to help the environment. Okay, do I have to do all 20? Do I have to be perfect at all 20? There may be certain something in my life, maybe using plastic is something very important because I am a very important, um, I am very busy. And my wife is very busy and we can't, and we have a lot of little kids and we just, we can't do it. Okay. So if it was us, sir, we can, you know, we don't say, well, I just can't do this. Halacha is too hard for me. No, it's halacha. If it's not pikuach, if it's not this, then it's us, sir. Because those areas of halacha are very strict very specific but if something you should be concerned okay i'm not good at this i'll be careful about other things i won't use my car i happen not to have a car it's not i wouldn't say oh, <laughs> the reason i don't have this car is because of climate change but if i you know have to think maybe i should buy a car one of the many factors would be hmm i want to be idealistic about this i'm not willing to to you know be the most careful in the world of these things. I don't think it's my responsibility to be 
super machmer on these things when more than the world demands or other people in the world are doing. But that's a factor. This is something I'm going to be machmer about, and this thing will be less. Again, if it was something clearly halachic, you can't say, you know, I'll be very careful about kashras and less careful about shabbos, or vice versa. You can't do that. You have to keep everything. But when it's something which is a greater picture, then you can. And I would also say that it's very important, and it's happening more and more, I've been involved in this, that rabbis are coming out and speaking about this topic. I think it's important for practical things. Now, the Jewish Orthodox Jews, this percentage of the, of, uh, the world population are a very small amount. But I think not only is, okay, everybody has to do their part. It's also a matter, I think, of Kiddush Hashem and Chil Hashem. The Torah should have something to say about just about everything. Okay, we may be the experts, but to give support to the experts and for the Torah not to have something to say on a global basis, I think is, is giving a false and wrong um, face of what the Torah is. And therefore I think it's important. And again, more and more it's happening. The rabbis are talking about it. And I know things are in the, the works and they're gonna continue more and more. I think that's important Kiddush Hashem and proper thing to do um, on, behalf, on behalf of the world. And um, again, the specific applications is not, is not my point here. Uh, hopefully I've um, uh, um, discussed the principles in a, in a uh, half reasonable way. Um, we have source sheets, um, in the future I may add on to them, but I thank everybody for, for listening, for taking part. Um, and I don't know, somebody's, is somebody coming on afterwards? If it's not somebody after, no, that's it. If anybody wants to stay on and ask and discuss, I'm happy to stay on. I'm not taking away from anybody else. I'm assuming no new speaker, then that's not a problem. Um, and anybody who, uh, that's the official end of our, of uh, our, my presentation. Wish well to, uh, to everybody. I have a question. Yeah. When you discuss a sub subject like this, it's a mixture of halacha and thinking straight. And halacha, you don't say, oh, the guy didn't do it. Uh, he uh, smoked too many cigarettes. Hashem is going to punish him. We're not going to, we, we don't trivialize like that. My problem with halacha analysis is when it's on a moral plane, it makes sense to me. When it's on a specific plane of details, uh, it's a difficulty. Right. So that's, if there, if it's possible, there's a specific grievous action, then maybe that grievous thing uh, can be answered. Um, I've seen people, there's a minute to take things of use from mitzvah, use it for another mitzvah. Okay. Um, I've seen people take their plastics from their lulav, that's what we call them, what, in, 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 zekel, I think we call them in Yiddish, and throw them in the fire to burn comments. Yeah. But that's a good example. I, and I, would, I would say that's also to do. It's very, it's be very specific. There's no reason in the world to do it. That's Except very, that you think it's wonderful. Very good good example. Example. That's, not, that's not justified. And therefore, I, and was, if I had the power, I would say, or maybe I, may, I think it is also. When you're talking about drive less, have less meat, use less plastic. So, right, I agree. You can't be very specific in that. And therefore, you have to give moral direction where we want to go. You should try to be more careful. You should try to be careful. But where is um, the line? In other words, you, you're not going to walk over the guy who burns a uh, cigarette paper and lets the smoke go up and say, you have been closer and what you've done, you deserve Malchus. You're going to say then you're a son of a gun, you shouldn't have done that. So where is the line between sh showing your disapproval and saying that's also Because we have the, the halachic process is usur and mutter. Not necessarily. Sometimes the halachic process can be can be guidance, especially when there's no other chance. Uh, excuse me for looking uh, extreme. My computer is a pretty good computer, but it has very volume is weak. So I, oh, I can so hear you better if I have a computer. So okay. It, 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 the more it, I like the moral approach. In other words. I find it difficult when you can assign 
a punishment for each of us to know that you're going to be kind of malchus, you're going to make it, you know, whatever it's going to happen. Or you're saying a good Jew does not smoke and, and pop from people's faces. And if he does do it, he's a son of a gun. But are you going to say to him, uh, we're going to throw you out of the shul or your usher and we're going to fine you or something like that? Like, where do you find I, I, the reason I'm raising the problem? Because I'm thinking about the problem of halacha and our time and its effect on people. The, when you, the effect on people is when you explain it in terms of moral terms. I, I found it very interesting, the sources that show responsibility for the whole world. The same thing though, I don't, I, I get a little bit difficulties in, in, in kashras where you discuss with, what, whether you're over a certain limit or something or not. How do you draw a line between moral behavior and just what's the limit? Uh, well, I would say the draw the line that uh, first was very hard to, to draw the line, and second, if you succeed in drawing the line, the line will be jagged. It's not going to be a straight line because the different situations are different. And some who give themselves to having very specific directives, and some are going to be very. Um, Judgmental. Yeah, it depends on the time. What's right in one community may not right in another community. Uh, what's right in one time not right in another time. Um, you know what? What are these situations? Yeah, yeah, it's important to be balanced. Um, how to be balanced is, is very hard. Balance is, means you have to have you have to control both sides of the scale. I remember once got a question when Israel, especially it was when Israel was having more of a um, a uh, water crisis that we haven't had in the last three years. I guess we haven't had it. But we had a pretty serious one. So somebody said, you have to give, you have to tell people when they do the TLC dime, they have to use a very small amount of water. What's the smallest amount of water you can do? And part of me, I was recently very careful in my house, at least in my, I felt I was being very careful about water. But Matthias, you're dying. I, I mean, okay, don't keep the water running the whole time when you're doing it, but. You can one say time you flush the toilet, place. one shower a month yeah. will be more than anybody could use in, in Diaz Adayim. So, I mean, a pick on, it's a mitzvah to, to pick that as the one place. So everything depends on context. It's very hard to, um, you know, what are you giving up? And to what extent, how serious the problem is? What extent can people live with it? Certain things. In theory, it's not a problem, but in just in practice, it's just it's upending people's lives. And therefore, the ability to say, you know what, take this seriously. Everybody will decide. One person will decide that he's not going to take the car. He's going to have a car, but he's not going to take it to work. So go to by, by work by subway. Or he'll okay? take two showers. Another person, it will only eat meat on Shabbos. Another person, it will stop using, uh, it will cut his, uh, his use of plastic by 90%. Everybody can find their ways of, oh, and, ah, one thing I wanted to say, and I'm still doing recording, which is very, very important. There's something, I don't know, I, I shouldn't be uh, um, even positively ethnic, but um, maybe so. It, 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 it is possible if we talk up the topic, this is an important topic. When I was a kid, maybe about, when I was a kid, the coolest thing to be in America was to be an astronaut. That was cutting edge of being, wow, you're an astronaut. Yeah. Being a doctor was pretty cool too. Um, okay, being an athlete also, but not two of my friends were going to be famous athletes. Um, but if we came to the point that the coolest thing that you can, or one of the coolest things that you can do in the world would to come up with a technology that will help deal with the problem, one person with a good head or a group of people with, with good heads can make an incredible difference. There's some incredible technologies out there now. And part of it, you don't need just scientists. To make those, those technologies that exist cheaper will make a huge difference. They have something which I think is the cool, one of the coolest thing. They have something, you have, I think in Iceland they have it, some type of huge um, installation that sucks up carbon from the air and turns it into rock and, puts, and has the rock underground make a cavity in the ground, suck up huge amounts of, of carbon. Incredible technology. Yeah. One person, we encourage that coolest thing. If you can 
come up with technologies or make them more feasible, um, then you know we can help do it. But that part of it is creating a mood that that's something worthwhile. Or somebody has money to invest. You can invest in bitcoins, or you can invest in um, a technology that can help. You know what? Go for it. Try to to go um, in that direction. These are things that people can do other than just holding back. And I think probably if you ask me, I'm not the expert in this field, I think probably there's more promise in this area. I was on the tip of my tongue. I was going to say at the end, I didn't. I'm now doing an overtime. I am now mentioning that uh, that idea uh, that we can make a real difference. Thank you very much. You're very much. Of course, I hope to come back okay. again. Howard, good to see you. It's good to see you. How long is the beard?